right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar on managing digital transformation in sports. It's a pleasure to have you connecting with us. Tonight, I am joined um, by Stephen Bork. Stephen is the program director, who now you see on, on camera. He's the program director of our online certificate program in managing digital transformation in sports. So in just a moment, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, and we're going we're gonna to have a, a conversation. And uh, we're also going to talk about the course that's starting uh, very soon later this month. So, Stephen, welcome. Yeah, Diego, thanks very much for having me. And uh, it's great to be joined by so many people. This is uh, this topic is really talking my language. So, you know, I'm really pleased to be able to speak about it tonight. Fantastic, fantastic. So we're going to dive in in just a moment. Um, just a couple of housekeeping details before we move on. The hashtag, if you want to, you know, tweet out and have uh, continue the conversation on, on Twitter, it's SBI Digi. Those of you who have attended our previous webinars, you will be familiar with this hashtag. So go ahead and use that while you tweet, and we will be monitoring that and keeping the conversation alive. As I mentioned before, tonight I'm joined by Steven, uh, and my name is Diego Valdez. I'm the director of the Sports Business Institute Barcelona. And, uh, you know, we specialize in uh, programs that are in the business side of sports. So we're very keen to talk about uh, digital transformation tonight. So what are we going to cover? Well, we're going to cover three points. Number one, we're going to look at the importance of digital transformation in sports. After that, we're going to look at some trends and digital transformation. And finally, we're going to talk about our certificate program in managing digital transformation in sports. It's an online program that begins later this month. So we're gonna be giving you details about that in case you may be interested in finding out more about it. But for now, let's let's begin the discussion um, with some of the important, important points about digital transformation. And for that, I'll turn it over to Steven. So Steven, um, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Diego. So what I wanted to speak about tonight is to really set the context for the importance of digital transformation in sport. And one of the key messages I want to get across is that while we talk about digital, the, the most important factor is people. And one of the, so one of the first topics in terms of its importance is actually the changing behavior of fans and consumers. So now we naturally come to expect in our daily lives those kind of conveniences that other brands, other non-sports brands can provide us. So we expect the Amazon type of customization from our own sports organization because we are freely open to them. We're passionate. We're a lifelong advocate of the, the team as a brand and we expect them to know us because if Amazon can know us just because we order some books or whatever else from them, we expect even more from, from our own sports organization. And that's quite a confronting challenge because sports organizations are typically quite small compared to you know these bigger organizations such as the Googles and the Amazons and Facebook and those who are really great at personalization. And we only have to look at the, the recent transfer of Ronaldo uh, to Juventus to consider how much um, behavior of fans has changed. The fact that Juventus have increased by, by 6 million fans while Real have gone down about a million fans shows that people don't necessarily follow a team anymore. What they follow is people because, and in some cases, these, these global superstars have a greater following than, than the team. And, uh, and that's really a unique proposition. And one of the things that in the course, but even in my own uh, work that I, I uh, post on content um, and you know share different opinions around the place is is to get into the the reasons why these things happen, not just that they are occurring. And so we know, for example, you know why do we have such a, a migration, if you like, um, for for Ronaldo? Well, it's because he's accessible to people uh, on social media, so they want to keep that access going. So they they want to follow him where, where he is. And that kind of lure is happening 
uh, even from a very young age. At the moment, it, it's it's based around millennials and the Gen Z people, but even in the future, it's going to become more and more apparent because uh, the, the younger uh, kids these days are, are accessing YouTube and coming up with um, stars of their own much before they have the chance to um, to to gain access like. Uh, to gain interest in, in sports. The, the second factor is that competition is, is now from non-sporting competitors. So before, before digital, before social media and, and the like, a, a league would, would, would operate in its own territory and the teams from within that league would all compete against each other for the, the, their share of fans. And they may also compete against, if we're in talking about football, they may compete against athletics and netball and basketball and, and, and other types of codes. Now, of course, all of that still happens, but what else is happening is now digital has brought so many more attention grabbers to the, the fingertips of, of every individual at, at every moment. So people now have choices, um, whether it's competitive gaming or not even competitive gaming, such as esports, it can just be gaming for, for entertainment value. Um, social media is now a big absorber of people's time where people just do that at, at, uh, essentially as a hobby. And then uh, video on demand, uh, the, the Netflix model, if you like, where we can just tap into a, a whole series on demand, you know, binge watching as it's called, and just lose ourselves in that for a whole afternoon or, or some, uh, some amount of time when before we might have allocated that time to, um, to to the, the football match, for example. And so these kind of things mean that the reaching new fans is a harder proposition than, than ever, because what we're seeing now as well is that young people aren't necessarily following in the footsteps of their siblings and their parents as the, that, that team is the, the rite of passage of, of fandom within the, within the household, because these youngsters, like I mentioned before, particularly on YouTube, maybe on Instagram, uh, are finding role models that they can relate to, that they think that reflect their own personal values and, and individuals are making up their mind on these kind of choices far earlier and with far more influence uh, in, uh, online. So that presents a new challenge for sport uh, as a whole and also um, sport businesses because we're we look at sustainability and we know from many factors, whether it's our TV audiences or our game uh, attendance, even sports participation itself, which is a, a strong indicator of our future fandom too. You know, these kind of things we see are in decline uh, around uh, so many, so many leagues across the, the globe. Uh, FIFA did an excellent job um, with the the recent World Cup in Russia and, and being able to achieve the levels of engagement that, that they did. So, you know, they're a great uh, model to, to learn from and I put a lot of that uh, learning into the, the course as well. And also the, the fourth point I mentioned there is future scaling. What I mean by that is that digital is, is here and it's going to stay. And in fact, the digital economy is only going to become more and more immersive, more automated, uh, and deeper experience for both organisations and uh, businesses alike, as well as government regulators and, uh, and, and so on. So it's not just about trying to put a Band-Aid on a, a bit of a fast moving problem now, it's far richer uh, in purpose than that. So we, we consider um, artificial intelligence now and organisations such as, such as Amazon, Google, Facebook and the like, uh, using artificial intelligence really well. And that's why we'll get a pop-up, you know, when we've looked at a website or we've looked, opened uh, some page, and then before you know, there's a, an ad coming at us for that because they've been able to use artificial intelligence. But they were only able to do that because they had their, their data and analytics uh, engine already well established. So you can't just jump in to, to the next iteration of digital without having laid the, the groundwork and the foundation earlier on. And, and we see this as well with, uh, with Stadia transformations or, or even new ones where there's so much investment in technology going into them. 
uh, that that actually becomes the um, often the the digital transformation centerpiece for organisations that may field a team, but also field um, that also have the responsibility for the venue. And then finally, the of, of the top five important factors that to consider for digital uh, transformation in sport is the organisation itself. And what we need to do is define a purpose in the in the digital age for the organisation, which is a an update to what the team would have originally intended itself to be previously. I often quote AS Roma here as the that they have their statement, their strategic intent that they want to be the most fan connected team in the world. That they couldn't have said that um, before digital came along, but now that they they've updated their their vision and who they want to be in the world to have this statement. And so now the challenge is for them to get all of the organization understanding that, but then having the, the business model, the operational processes, and importantly, the people working together. And so transformation is really, as I said from the start, more about people and getting people to, to work together than it is about the technologies. The technologies and the investment in them are the, the practical execution of what the, the strategic purpose is. And you know, I think this is a really important topic these days when a lot of studies come out from very reputable houses like Nielsen that, uh, that say that in the US at least uh, up to 85% of people in organisations are not engaged. You know, and I think a little bit about that and I think, well, perhaps because they don't feel that the culture and also the the day-to-day -day organization is empowering them to be as effective operators as they know other people in other organizations can be. You know, I could only imagine what it's like to work at Google for it, for example, and that becomes a very aspirational type of thing. And we, we know also from studies that so many people, whether they're on the front line in, in the, the sales connected area or even back of house, don't have the, the tools, more than 50% of people don't have the tools that they need to be able to effectively do their job. So automatically there's a lot of frustration and then you throw in all of the different attention grabbers and, and we get these really high levels of uh, employee disengagement. And so, you know, I think that one of the best things that we can do is inspire the people with a, a high level purpose in the, the digital age. And that's why I often reference the, uh, the AS Roma. Uh, case. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about um, digital transformation trends. Before that, I might just touch on, you know, what digital transformation is. I've mentioned it a, a few times, and you know, we see it mentioned in in media and print and and online and and so on to the point that perhaps it, it could be considered a buzzword or, or overhyped and, and so on. But I, I think it really still has its use uh, to be called digital transformation. You know, uh, I don't think we've gone so far along yet that, that we say, oh, of course, it's a, it's a transformation. But what it really is, is it's a change management program that, that has been brought out of the changes that digital technologies and the behaviours, more importantly, that digital technologies have unleashed um, within the organisation, but more importantly, um, with our customer base. And that's you know, circling back to the very first point that I made. So there's many attempts to define digital transformation, and I'm not going to quote them now, but what I would say is that there's some certain key characteristics that are present in, in any statement of definition about what um, digital transformation means. And that is that, most often, it's about changing the organisation to be more in line with the, the ex expectations of new customers. It can also be to improve operational efficiencies, and we would, all, we would often see that in logistics type organisations, for example, where they don't have a, a strong customer experience component, but we would see them as well in, in Stadia, uh, as I mentioned before. So that, that really underpins the, the purpose of digital transformation. And then there's, there's certain elements that work within that, that transformational program, and that is to define a strategy, 
to update business models. And by updating business models, an example could be we're now, like, as an organisation, pursuing broader markets where, you know, now that digitisation has brought the, the, uh, the, the globe into a smaller realm, organisations now look outside of their own territory and try and get uh, followers from, from outside. So that's a, that's a business model change. The other thing that is changing is the internal processes. And also, you know, uh, and then finally, what investments are made to support all of those things. So you'd only have to imagine social media, for example, and think about, okay, how did that change the, the business model of the organisation? You know, the organisation chart need to be changed, resources needed to move there, uh, needed to, to think strategically about the reason for being uh, on each of those different channels. And then after those decisions are made, then the organisation needed to work out what internal processes it was going to have to finally publish onto those uh, those channels, who had responsibility, what type of uh, content was going to be generated from where that would come, you know, video, images, um, text, and all of those kind of things need internal processes. And then because of social media, there that brought in a need to understand the audience who was engaging with the with the team or, or brand. And so technical the in investments were required in, in, in anal analytics and um, listening technologies and maybe uh, uh, marketing platforms as well. And so you can see just by the introduction of, of one digital technology, social media, it changed all of those things within an organisation. And I haven't spoken about all of the other ones, but certain other ones can be virtual reality, augmented reality, mobile computing, cloud computing, uh, and these days um, increasingly uh, blockchain. So every one of these digital technologies has the ability to transform the, the business model, the internal processes and the technological investment. But it all comes back to really knowing what your North Star is. And that's why, once again, I, I like to reference that AS Roma one, because they can fit all of their decisions on, on those tiers that I mentioned into how well the investment and the change would connect into their, into their strategy of being the, the most fan connected team in the world. And importantly, the, the fundamental thing that, that uh, techno digital technologies has created is a digital communication revolution. You know, it hasn't created a, like an industrial revolution, if you like. It's created a, a change in how people access information, share information and the like. And as I was mentioning just before, this then means that the organisation needs to change the way it's communicating with, with individuals and then track those conversations analyze that information and then develop products and services along that and so what we also have the ability to do now is to actually understand the the, the fan journey we're a fan you know all of our waking hours but there's only certain times that that we interact with the team whether that's uh, look, looking up news or uh, you know different team announcements or whatever but then there's a very narrow time where we actually transact with the brand or the team as well. And that, those are the times, all of the touch points, whether they're uh, just uh, interactions as well as the, the retail tra uh, transactions all have to be mapped and have to work very well uh, for what the, the fan uh, needs that interaction to be designed for. All of this has been brought about because of that, that digital communication change. The other thing that I think is a, a key trend is that uh, sports teams are now turning into lifestyle brands or, or the, the, the ones who do it very well. Are. And what that means is that they reflect the aspirations of the individuals who follow them uh, in, in such a way that even fans share in the content development and a, AS Roma once again you know, on their website, they have a an area where content is created by the fans and they really encourage that because that's part of the connect, connectivity. But on the reverse side of it, we, we then see that those fans, because it, it's a lifestyle uh, evolution, are uh, then doing things, you know, maybe they've got the AS Roma strip on and they're on holidays and they post that uh, and then the, the 
the team shares that and so on. Um, Bayern Munich do that very well. And in fact, one of the, one of Bayern Munich's, uh, well, some of the top five Bayern Munich shared posts were actually posts that came from their fans doing different things like bungee jumping, in, uh, wearing the, the Bayern kit. And so it shows that that is an indicator of a team being a, uh, a lifestyle brand. The other thing that these lifestyle brand type teams are doing or leagues is engaging in esports in a way that extends it into that lifestyle part. So it's not just about that that moment of time when when a match is on and you know generating excitement beforehand, doing analysis at the end. A lifestyle brand gives us that twenty four seven coverage, which everyone wants these days. Uh, everyone wants that on demand feel, and being a lifestyle brand is how the best ones are doing that. And then that also helps them um, with, with content, with building followership, with them being able to negotiate um, better deals with corporate partners, which in then in turn unlocks even better uh, content opportunities because now there's co-creation uh, with, uh, with partners uh, and on that cycle goes. And increasingly, the, the fourth trend I've listed there is that um, broadcast or, or you know live match viewing is increasingly moving online and we saw that with the world cup where there was more live streaming of matches after the preliminary the pool rounds than there was for the whole of the, the 2014 world cup and people are doing that more and more on mobile about half the people are now watching uh, online uh, on mobile so what we're doing is we're incorporating the viewership uh, into our daily lives and it's becoming more on demand as well and I know even from my own experience you know, following sport in Australia I have global passes I can just watch the, the games when I want where I want and it's really a, a liberating thing to be able to include that uh, into uh, into your lifestyle and, and more and more people are, are moving that way and uh, another thing that, that is happening is that uh, people are turning to YouTube for highlights of matches as well. So rather than watching a whole game, that they just want those uh, snackable bites, if you like, of, uh, of content. And I saw a figure of 85% of young fans who follow the English Premier League in the UK uh, had, had uh, access uh, highlights on YouTube. So the, what the fan wants in terms of its consumption is where the, the business then needs to, to lead to. And that turns back to the very first point that I mentioned as well is that digital transformation is to align to customer expectations. And the, the fifth one is that new technologies are creating an even more immersive experience. So prior to the last 18 months or so, and I've been developing uh, this course and, and keeping an eye on trends for the best part of four years now, when I, I first was reviewing the digital technologies that were having the most profound effect, the technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence and blockchain hadn't really gained market acceptance. And in, in the last 18 years, to, uh, sorry, 18 months to varying degrees, um, they, they are reaching that, that penetration. And any time a new technology comes along in society, or automatically sport has to think, how can we apply this technology to us? You know, there, there's never a technology that sport goes, oh no, that one doesn't reflect um, what we need. Because sport by its very being is a, a reflection of of society and so you know it's not like the the finance sector that might be able to take you know this technology might be able to take cloud computing but virtual reality doesn't matter in the finance world or or, or augmented reality and so on but every technology that comes along has a has a sport implication and so then it's a matter of uh working out how to approach all of those decisions that are coming at us um because of new technologies and we're only going to, going to get deeper and deeper you know i think augmented reality particularly uh in stadia is is um going to become more popular virtual reality is you know still a, a difficult proposition because of the clunky headgear and and the, it doesn't lend itself naturally to uh, a shareable experience but if those kind of challenges get overcome then you know we can see 
you know, that one creating more immersive experiences as well. And I guess also, you know, we could consider even esports as a, a technology or, or definitely a technology platform. And that's really uh, driving uh, increasingly immersive experiences too. Then the, the, the third of the, the topics that I was going to talk about with you tonight is the value of, um, of the, the course uh, in, in the context of the, the topics that I just mentioned. So one of the, for me, the, the most interesting findings that, that I've had along the way is that, you know who the, the latest people to the party in terms of digital transformation are? It's actually leadership. Before that, people within the organisation are doing things or want to be doing things uh, in terms of moving the organization forward in the way that they they know like we we can be using different tools in our daily life that we want to be able to to use in in work but they're, they're not necessarily available it seems like there's a divide at the moment between our work life and our and, and our personal life in terms of um, how we are able to to access different technologies the thing that surprise me is that there's there's certain models of digital transformation maturity that you know they, they might be a a six phase model for example and it's not until about the fifth or, or the second last of the these most mature maturity models that formal leadership get involved and, and say okay we're going to now have a purposeful transformation before that we've got four steps of people whether that's whether it's management whether it's uh supervisors whether it's even um, other people in the organization say you know what i think i believe in this idea you know i think it's the right thing for our organization i've seen it over there that would work for us you know and then they go about you know, um, making how can that happen how can i move that forward and these people are the ones who are the engaged people and they are the ones who want to move the organization forward in the digital era and they need support and there's certain ways that, that, that people can unlock their value as a change agent and that's one of the things that we look at in the organ uh, in, in the course and it really struck me uh, when when we were doing a, a, an earlier round of the the course when people were asking yeah, this is all great but how can i go back and apply it you know how can i bring this into my own organization so we actually spend time talking about how agents of change in other organizations have been able to successfully break through and create changes in their, their own organization. There are certain steps that can be taken to do that. <clears throat> the, the second one is that um, it is a successful digital transformation um, system is de defined. So in fact, I've come up with a, a 10 point um, program of different responsibilities that organizations now have in the, the digital age that they didn't have in previous um, times. And when we road tested this in a, in a previous course, the and I had other models uh, like even McKinsey models, Nielsen models, whatever, and said to the, the, the people doing different topics that they were free to use any different models that they wanted to and, and they chose to use the, uh, the 10 point responsibility matrix that, that I had developed. And so what I've done now is develop that more so that anyone who's undertaking the course can actually quickly assess how mature their organization is and also develop a, a quick understanding of those priority areas that need to be addressed to be able to move forward in, in a digital transformation. And we set that up as a bit of a project as well. So uh, people end up with um, the, outcomes that are practically based. Another thing that, that I really am an advocate for is for organisations becoming a social business. I, I don't think that organisations on the whole have really embraced social medias uh, and digital media's power uh, enough. Less than 50% of all organisations have social media objectives that are aligned to the organisation or enterprise objectives. So that means that they're, they're really hidden within the, 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 the marketing level of the, the organization rather than reaching up to the, the top of the organization. And if the top of the organization is, is paying attention to what works best, like the, the tone of voice, the, the style, the different content, putting resources behind these things and understanding that developing 
great content and, and storytelling for the brand is the way that more revenues that are going to be realized, it's the only growth market there is, then that is going to start the, the organization uh, onto becoming a, a, a what I term a, uh, a social business where it's a cyclical program of developing great content, getting more followers, <laughs> leveraging those things with with commercial organisations uh, and so on, as I uh, touched on earlier. So we spend a bit, fair bit of time talking about the different factors that play out in, in being a, uh, a social business and also unlocking commercial uh, revenues. Fourthly, uh, the, the course has uh, what, what I've taken to be the, you know, the best ideas that I've seen from across the globe for the, the, the past four or so years from it doesn't uh, like any any sport, um, and, and even outside of sport, there's there's great examples of organisations doing things. It could be Disney, it could be Caesars Entertainment, um, and so what we take. You know, I couldn't say like, how many examples of great ideas, concepts of, of activations, or ways that organisations have been innovative in their use of. Uh, storytelling or in their use of, of different technologies and so those things are uh, you know almost like a playbook of their own um, in terms of different ideas for, for different applications and, and and different ways that the digital transformation can be exposed externally um, from from the organization and and finally and, and this is something that you know I took from participants in the previous course because it was the first one that, that we'd ran and you know I didn't know exactly the type of sentiment that people were going to get from it. But what, what we found out is that people were able to, they felt empowered to think for themselves about identifying next trends or to be able to critically consider the, the, the next investment. So, okay, blockchain is coming up now and that they, they now have systematic tools and a mindset to be able to, to mine that opportunity uh, and, and to be able to present a business case within their own organisation for that. Uh, and also we, we did some um, great exercises in terms of uh, if an organisation was going to embark on an esports uh, venture or uh, run a hackathon or even develop its, its own um, strategic digital transformation, how would um, organisations go about that? And so all of those learnings uh, get shared across the group as well. So Diego, I know I covered uh, a fair bit of ground quickly there, but I also want to leave time for questions and so on. So I'll just hand back to you for now. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, just to summarize a little bit of what Stephen has been mentioning, the program starts uh, in uh, th this month. In fact, it starts September 17th. We push back the date by a week because a lot of people were asking, um, you know, if they could start uh, one week after that. So um, the course will actually begin September 17th. So there is still some time to register. Um, and as Stephen was mentioning, here are some of the main points that uh, you can expect to cover, to be covered during the program. So for example, monetization of digital assets for a sports organization. And, and Stephen already talked about some of these points. Obviously the strategic overview for deployment, uh, of new technology within a sports property, opportunities for fan engagement. So, I mean, a lot of these points already have been covered, but just for you to have uh, an overview, we will also look at forecasting and evaluating digital trends, uh, and as well as how to network with top sports executives, which we'll talk about just now uh, a little bit further on when we discuss uh, some of the guest speakers that we're gonna be bringing on for the program. Um, very briefly, sort of to summarize what the program entails, obviously the language is 100% in English, so you can do it from no matter where you are in the world. If you speak English and you have an internet connection, you can, uh, you can join us for these webinars. Um, the format is online, and what we have is bi-weekly live video conference sessions with top industry executives. So we bring in guest speakers from the top, organizations in sports that are experts in their domain and they give a you know short presentation followed by an interactive discussion with all of the participants so you have an opportunity to ask questions to interact with a lot of these experts from some of the top organizations 
Um, program begins in September, as I mentioned, September 17th, and it runs through to December 12th. So it's a four month program. Um, we also have uh, a mentoring and guidance uh, service. In other words, if you want to have some advice as to your next career move, if you want to know, you know what your next step should be, whether it is within your organization, as Stephen was mentioning, uh, or you know transitioning to a position in the business of sports, you know you can always get in touch with us, and we'll be happy to provide that assistance and mentorship. Um, the program is aimed at those that are looking to improve their digital literacy, uh, and uh, as, as Stephen has mentioned before, want to be agents of change or lead and manage that change within their organization. We'll talk a little bit more about the fee in just a moment when we when we move on. Uh, and uh, I think that's essentially what you know what the course uh, entails. So what what we could talk about now, Stephen, perhaps is the actual learning objectives. Uh, of the program, and then we can move on and talk uh, a little bit more about um, you know who we're going to bring on as, as guest speakers. Okay. The, uh, well, several studies, and and I reference a lot of studies in the in the course because you know, I you know I've done academic degrees, but you know I want this to be a a practically based course, so you know it's steer kind of a, a away from academia but learn from you know the best practitioners and and studies out there and uh, one of one of the the factors that I've come across which I, I consider deeply in constructing the course is that the biggest barrier to any digital transformation is for people within the organization to understand uh, the, the language if you like of of digital and digital transformation, digital maturity, etc. So, the, like the, the whole course then um, is is based on uh, learning to to think and act strategically in uh, in, in the era of um, sports business in the in the digital economy. And one one of the the best takeaways I had from presenting the course last year was when um, what one of the participants reached out to me midway through the course and. Uh, uh, to, to thank me for the content and uh, how it has changed his ability to to think strategically and, and, and shift his mindset, uh, you know, not only on a day to day basis, but on a, uh, you know, a more longer term view. And he was able to, to translate that kind of thinking and that kind of language uh, into um, his proposal and an interview for a higher level job. And so he, he moved into to management, he was able to, you know, he credited the tools that he had gained so quickly um, from within the course. And so, you know, that that for me is the um, the, the best um, re reward for presenting this course. So just to move quickly through the, the modules, we, we start with a, an introduction and, you know, we, we talk about uh, the ways that sport is really facing a, a different current reality than, than it ever has. Um, you know, it has always been well, position within society and, and held its own place. But now, you know, there's there's different factors nibbling away at it. And so we explore what all of those things are and, and, and uh, look at them from now, but also, you know, point to their future. Uh, I mentioned before the, the 10 digital age responsibilities that uh, is a model that I've developed and I'm continuing to, to refine. Uh, you know, I, I believe in that one. And, you know, I, I want to give participants the opportunity to Critically examine your own organisation in those uh, those ten responsibilities, and so I've matrixed out a uh, like a, a beginner level. What what each of these responsibilities would look like a beginner level, all the way to to a grade five uh, proposition, and from that we can then build out each. Uh, individuals understanding of their own uh, position, the, your own organisation position, or or those factors that uh, you can really influence easily, then. Um, the, the next part of it is to move into digital transformation itself and to cover in more depth uh, some of the, the concepts that I talked about tonight, such as digital transformation, digital maturity, and, and what a lot of the, um, the research and, and literature um, shows. And, you know, it's interesting that there's only about, in any industry, between 10 and 15% of organisations that are digitally mature. Uh, you know, organisations are slower to move than people are, 
regulators and, and government bodies are even slower than organizations to, to do that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a, a criticism as such, it's a reflection of the, the pace of change um, that is tilting organizations now. And, uh, you know, what we look at in the, 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 the next models is where the, the rubber really hits the road on what a good digital transformation looks like. And so there's um, a lot of case studies that, that have been learned from now about what the different success factors look like. And also um, we look at what the barriers are as well. You know, if organisations have failed to, to get to where they, they really aspire to be, you know, what are the particular reasons uh, behind those things? And, uh, you know, but once again, most of the, the reasons that, and the top reasons are, are, are always people-based, people-based in terms of being a successful digital transformation and people-based in terms of being a, uh, a failed transformation. Failed in terms of, no, they weren't able to transform at all. But it's, it's a failure in being able to move far enough along the digital maturity curve to be a, a really proactive participant and be ahead of the, the, the game in terms of understanding what is next for those organisations. Because if you don't have the, the right combination of the success factors happening, then you're not able to, you know, consistently enough move the organisation forward. And so that's the uh, the journey that we, we take with that. And at all cases, what we, we look at the different um, best practice organisations um, from outside of sport, um, but also um, sports organisations and, and look at even, you know, on a more granular level, you know, organisations that have been great with their leadership, organisations that have been great with their culture and, and so on. So we, we um, are always applying this on a practical level. Then we look at, you know, data and analytics underpin digital transformation, regardless of, of any other investments. If you don't have the right building blocks in place, then it's going to be frail or fragile. You need to have good analytics strategy and then the investment and then the execution and the, and the, the culture and the people and so on. So we, we look at uh, a range of topics related to, to that, um, but also the other thing that, that I'm passionate about is what I refer to as a, uh, a digital line of sight, which means that you've got a, a, an enterprise level strategy, then you've got a digital marketing model, then you've got social platform selection, then you have your uh, data and analytics platform or, or its own strategy, and then you have technological investment that align to each of those and, and they actually have arrows going up and down because they one informs the other. It's a two way thing. And so what but marketing is critically in, in the center of that. And I mentioned before how oftentimes social objectives aren't aligned to enterprise objectives. So, you know, the, the organization is not maximizing uh, its opportunity. So look at how marketing can be really robust in terms of um, it's, it becoming the glue of the, uh, what I once again refer to as that digital line of sight. And then I mentioned before about how uh, becoming a social business is, is the key to unlocking uh, increased uh, fan engagement. Increasing fan engagement when done best increases revenues because people are, are in that sweet spot of enjoying the, the experience or the interaction that they have and being and, and putting more value to that uh, by reaching into their, their hip pocket or, or swiping their, their card. And so we, we look at uh, those things and we also pay special attention to, um, to eSports uh, as well. You know, that's a, a, another fascinating area that I think is only going to get richer uh, in, in terms of its, its share of market and become, you know, more of a um, threat to, uh, to sport. And particularly when dedicated eSports venues uh, pop up uh, and people youngsters, even older people are, are able to go and, and hang out there and really enjoy competitive gaming as a lifestyle, you know, and that's something that, that sport can't offer. We only have sport, you know, on the, the, the Sunday afternoon or, you know, two or three times a week at, at best. But when there's these dedicated community spaces uh, and they're starting to, to come along now and, you know, the, these these places look really nice and they're, they're really cognizant of the way that the um, you know, that the esports fans want, want to move around, that's going to be a, a game changer as well, I think. 
And then um, once again, um, you know, I talked about data and um, in terms of its importance to marketing, but we also spend time developing, the, um, you know, what would be a marketing strategy and, and also the, the different components that, that go into uh, making a, a successful organisation that, you know, I don't like the term data driven because, you know, we, we should be people driven, but for sure we, we should be data enabled, you know, how do we get to that point of being data enabled? And the research suggests that even the most mature organisations, and I men mentioned that you know there's 10 to 15 percent of them across all industries, that even they struggle with overcoming the, the challenges of um, mastering data and analytics. And part of that that reason, without diving too deeply, is that leadership typically don't take a strong direct role uh, in sponsoring those initiatives or keeping track of them. You know, maybe they just don't have time for, for that level of detail. Uh, but, you know, that's that's one of the um, the, the constraints for uh, having becoming a data master. And then finally, we'll look at each of the other uh, digital technologies in turn uh, and their application uh, in sports business. So once again, you know, you can become proficient in identifying, you know, what good use cases look like. Uh, and also, um, you know, the, the, one of the first things that, that drove me to develop this course was, you know, talk about the digital economy and, and these kinds of things. I couldn't even, you know, Google, okay, what are all the digital technologies? So, you know, put together the, the list that I think are the most important ones and, you know, you can see them listed there and, and, and it continues to grow from, um, you know, from year to year. But, uh, you know, what we at least now have a, a context for what is actually driving um, consumer behaviour that the organisation now needs to um, to adjust its business model through these technological investments. So um, well, what like we, we ran this course for the first time at the start of this year. We're very pleased to uh, to have along uh, some of you know some people representing some of the biggest brands uh, in in um, global football, but also some from emerging um, nations or, or leagues, if you like. And, and that contrast is, is brilliant because people from different um, environments ask different questions and, and the learnings are, are much richer as a result of it. So we get people from uh, Latin America asking, you know, but how can we move this kind of thing forward within our own environment when, you know, maybe Wi-Fi or, or uh, um, broadband infrastructure isn't as strong in, in that environment versus, you know, FCB or um, Real Madrid that have, you know, the, the most advanced stadia and so on. So, you know, it's great conversation, it's great learnings, uh, you know, across the board uh, as well. And then there's there's some brands that, you know, through the, the research have, have emerged strongly uh, as as real leaders in in their own organization or even um, within the industry as being the, the most innovative uh, and you know so some of these uh, and and I haven't limited it to, to football I haven't limited it to one particular region uh, and so we have examples from uh, different codes in the US at Golden State Warriors are a great example Orlando Magic the same Dallas Mavericks Sacramento Kings are another great example. Uh, and then uh, in in the world of football, uh, Bayern Munich have a great digital transformation case study. AS Roma um, actually reached out after we shared their prominence to say, well, we'd love to, to help, um, you know, profile uh, our organisation with you because, you know, we, we appreciate, you know, being shown in that light. Um, Seattle Sounders in Major League Soccer is doing great things and then the ones that we, you know, know intimately such as Man City, Real Madrid and, and Barca as well. And then others that, that I think are great case studies are Gatorade, Disney, Nike, even um, Caesars Entertainment. Um, Disney is really interesting because they, they view their, their theme parks as, as a supercomputer. Uh, so the learnings from them are really rich as well. Diego, would you like to take it from here? Sure. So we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the guest speakers that we have lined up, and then we'll turn it over for your questions because we want to hear if you have any particular questions about the program. So, um, you know, Stephen mentioned data. 
Uh, well, we're bringing in someone who is an absolute expert. Charlie Shin is the vice president of data and analytics at Major League Soccer. He already participated in the program last edition and uh, you know, he's just one individual that you can learn from and you can extract uh, so much knowledge based on the case study that he presents about Major League Soccer, but that can be implemented and that, you know, the learnings can be taken away for, you know, matter, no matter where you are in, uh, you know, in the business of sports. So he's one of the uh, guest lecturers that we have on board for the program. We also have the Director of Innovation of the Orlando Magic, Jack Elkins, who, who talks about how they've, um, you know, created uh, a culture of innovation at the Orlando Magic and uh, he comes in and gives a, a fantastic guest lecture. So again, as Stephen was mentioning, it's, um, you know, individuals that uh, really do present case studies that uh, are excellent learnings for anybody who's looking to, you know, benefit from um, their experience. We also have Russell Subedi. Um, Russell is the president of Core Planning and Insights and he's also uh, another expert when it comes to data. So, uh, an, you know, great lineup of speakers. Mario Leo, uh, founder and CEO of Result Sports. If some of you follow him and follow Result Sports on social media, you'll see that they do digital benchmarking, digital monetization for some of the top clubs in football, in European football. So, again, another uh, really top notch individual that comes in and shares his, his knowledge. David Jones, Senior Vice President of IT Europe um, AEG, who uh, was recently involved with the e, um, eSports uh, Tournament and World Cup uh, that they ran in London for FIFA. So again, these uh, individuals really have a wealth of information and we have um, one or two lined up that uh, we cannot confirm just yet, but that are uh, really interesting, uh, big names that uh, we're talking to. To, to bring onto the program. So our objective is to really you know, give you guys the opportunity to have access to executives that day in, day out, deal with these sort of issues so that you can you know, pick their brain and you can learn from them, but also engage with them and actively you know, collaborate during the program as you are moving along. So there's a couple of uh, interesting lined up uh, guest speakers that uh, we'll confirm soon enough. And uh, both Stephen and I will, uh, you know, will be talking about those later on. Finally, uh, you know, just to, to, to sum it all up, the program starts on September 17th, has a duration of two months. We talked before about the fee. It's 2,950 euros for the four-month program. There's no additional fee um, for any books or any other, um, you know, um, anything else that you need to invest in. So that's all covered in the four months. You get access to, like I said, some of the top guest speakers. And of course, Stephen, who, as you know, is uh, you know one of the leading experts himself when it comes to digital transformation, as, uh, as you've seen some of his publications. Um, finally, some testimonials. You know, we talked about some of the organizations and some of the executives that participated in last edition. Well, here we have Mateo from CONCACAF. Uh, who is a digital specialist for them um, and you know I won't read the testimonial but you see that he had a lot of value that he you know took away from the program uh, the materials the speakers and you know the 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 learning experience for him was very positive in his role at CONCACAF we also had someone from the Qatar Football Association in their legal department so Costas is a legal advisor for the, the QFA. And uh, again, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to come from a technical background or that you have to be, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a space where you need to know a lot about technology. Quite the contrary, digital transformation encompasses the entire um, organization. And you see someone like Costas getting a massive value about, you know, the new technologies and what he took away for his role at the Qatar Football Association. Um, the last point that we will share here is, uh, as, as we've already outlined in this presentation, the main challenge to digital transformation is a lack of digital liter literacy at leadership and employee levels. So what we've done with this course is we've, we've aimed it to be the solution 
for those that are already working in the industry and that want to transition into the business side of sport to have that solution with this program. Um, that's what we wanted to cover tonight. So we'll turn it over for your questions. If you have any particular questions about the program, if you want to discuss any particular you know, subject matter as to what Stephen mentioned earlier on, you know, feel free to add it in the chat box and we'll be monitoring this, those questions. Like I mentioned before, we are starting on September 17th. So there's still some time. If you are interested in registering, <clears throat> let us know, get in touch with our team and we'd be delighted to um, you know, answer any questions, set up a call with you and find out a little bit more about your learning objectives and your current you know, role and your future aspirations and see if this course may be the right fit for what you're looking for. So there's our website, there's the contact email, contact at sbibarcelona.com. And you know, we'll be we'll be happy, like I said, to set up a conversation with you to find out more about your, your aspirations. Um, we have a question here, uh, a more general question from Peace. And he says, with people moving more and more to digital, doesn't that threaten stadium sales or attendances? So that's a good question. Um, Stephen, what are your thoughts as to how, uh, you know, sports properties are adapting to, you know, these, as we talked about before, these consumption patterns that are changing and how digital, you know, is also having an, uh, an effect on, um, on, you know, on the match day. So anything that we, we that you'd like to add to, to peace in this particular question? Well, I think that, you know, that there's multiple elements to it. The, 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 the main point that, that I think is that uh, digital, is the way to uh, unlock further um, revenues for, for the organization. It's really the only growth reven um, growth stream that you're going to get that is within your control. If you happen to be a, a big team and you know getting the uh, broadcast benefits from from the league, then that's a different matter. But in terms of in terms of revenue streams within your own control, uh, digital is an enabler of that, but it, it's a long play. And, uh, you know, I mentioned it a couple of times today in, in becoming that social business. And and uh, it was it was interesting that Microsoft published this uh, study just recently called The Art of Storytelling, which, which you can look up. And they said that 71% of how uh, um, a brand uh, is valued is through the quality of its own content. And you know, I think that that really resonates for sport because we have such a, a great story to tell. And you know, so it's about really knowing your narrative, being strong with with your voice online and so on, and being able to create uh, compelling content that that pushes the boundaries. And you know, you, you only have to look at AS Roma's uh, English channel to to see you know how how well they do it. That Bayern Munich is is really good in that space as well. But it is a long play in in building up the followership and then you know leveraging those details and particularly levels of engagement, um, you know, with uh, with, with corporate partners either new or existing, and and you know we're we're seeing new uh, models of of monetizing digital assets coming along all of the time these days. So uh, and then in turn, as I mentioned, having corporate corporate partners brings in another. Um, agency who can be used to, to create innovative content as well because each uh, each partner can become part of that platform so and then there's you know a, another strategy that is being used really successfully uh, to, to offset you know any any disadvantages is what um, one that AS Rome has done very well where they've mapped the the the, the match day experience um, of their fans and I talked about touch points and, and you know the journey that fans take. They went and negotiated with with Uber to have a uh, a special arrangement for fans to to attend to the the game. Uh, and then the, they also went and did a, a similar deal with with Waze, um, who are a navigational type app. And then they've got their their team uh, like prominent players giving guided tours into you know around. Uh, around Rome and, and into the stadium, so it really brings to light these other things, and they're able to, to you know, create new revenues because they were able to, uh, you know, understand what the fan journey was, and then go out and say, okay, we've got this element of the fan journey that we now want to talk to you about, you know, possible corporate partner. 
Um, so I, I hope I've, I've answered your question on the right track there. Okay, excellent. Thanks for your question, Peace. We have another question, Stephen, from Max, Max de la Torre Etasso. And he says, do you also cover the various ways for sportsmen to monetize? So how to value a particular player for a brand and the various deals to be done? You know, we, we don't talk so much at the individual player level, um, you know, per se. Um, you know, we had a, a participant um, on the course who actually came from a startup in, in that that way uh, last last time, and, and she gave a, a presentation from within, you know, being a participant on on how her organisation does those kind of valuations. And you know, th this is the the thing that I like about the online format is if, if we have particular requirements from with the participants, we'll go out and source uh, someone to, to, you know, give a, an ad hoc uh, presentation. You know, I, I have a, a wealth of contacts uh, globally that, you know, can uh, readily come along that they're great sharers. The, the second part, uh, though, that we do cover in content is increasingly how um, player platforms are, are disrupting the, the media um, Industry in terms of who owns the, um, the the stories and and who is most appealing. Like we would prefer to hear far more from from athletes, you know, from real people than from corporate accounts. And we have, you know, there's the the Players Tribune is the the leading one. Dugout, um, you know, is doing a, a similar job actually. Um, you know, you can go and look on SBI's website. I, I did a uh, an infographic and, and a bit of a, a short. Um, blog about the different uh, types of um, player-led platforms that are now out there that are developing and distributing content. Uh, and then there are, like there was an agency just this week, uh, a player-driven agency that is looking to um, you know, monetize for, for players um, out there. So well, we do touch on, on things and, you know, if like that or any other topic, if people want to go deeper on than is in the content, then uh, you know, if one of the guest speakers can't speak to that, then we'll find someone else who can as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a very good question, Max. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll forward you. In fact, we'll make sure we forward you the article that uh, Stephen wrote about the athlete platform, so you have an idea as to you know what he what he was talking to just now about the Players Tribune, and it's it's really fantastic. I mean, you see guys like you know Gerard Piquet interviewing Neymar, and uh, you know it is changing the way we are. Consuming that content, so that's that's on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, as, as Stephen Moore pointed out, uh, we do adapt and make sure that if there's any questions or if there's any particular you know matters that uh, need to be discussed throughout the program, this is this is the objective of the live sessions. That it's a very collaborative course where you have an opportunity to engage with some of your other participants, where you have an opportunity to engage with the guest speakers, with Stephen, with myself. And all the while, there's there's a uh, you know fluid discussion. So definitely, that's something that we could uh, you know we could touch upon if uh, if there would be a need to to discuss. But we'll send that over to you via email. Um, right. So let me just check and see if there's any additional questions for now, or if we've reached. Uh, for now, I think that's it. Uh, Max says, "Great, thank you." Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Max. Thanks for signing on tonight. So Stephen, I think uh, that's about it from uh, from the questions tonight. I'm sure there's people that uh, will uh, you know will email us, and uh, I've recognized a few of the names of some of the people that uh, I've spoken to and that have already signed on to the program. So it's nice to see that they're uh, you know signing on to this webinar and are anxious to start on the 17th. So that said. Um, you know, uh, if you have any questions, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you know, feel free to reach out. Contact at sbibarcelona.com is the email. So send us a note, let us know, and we'll be happy to set up a call. We'll be happy to find out more about your, your aspirations. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that, uh, you know, you have all the facts to make your decision if you want to move forward with this program. So, Stephen, I'll turn it over to you for, for any final comments uh, or final word, if, if you will. You know, like mine is, is just to thank everyone. Uh, like I said at the start, you know, this is a, a real um, passion and, and sweet spot of interest for me. So, you know, I appreciate that uh, you're like-minded in that way. And if you want to uh, 
connect with me, then then please send a, a, a LinkedIn invitation. Uh, and, and that way, you know, you can get access to, to different content that I may have, um, you know, um, published during, um, you know, the, the time as well, uh, as well as on SBI. And, and speaking of which, I'm, I'm developing a, uh, a post just now on uh, digital marketing models and the different ones that are employed throughout um, the, the sports industry. So um, we'll be publishing that next week as well. So stay tuned for that one. But otherwise, I, I know everyone's time is really valuable. So I appreciate uh, you spending some of that with me. Thanks very much. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And thank you, Stephen, as always, for sharing your, your wealth of knowledge and information with us and our community. So looking forward, looking forward to the 17th when we're all going to you know, jump on and start this uh, transformative journey with the program. So all the best to everybody. Good night, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you're connecting from. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.